so then that led to a trial. Yes. Uh, was it common for British soldiers to be tried in colonial courts? No. No, British soldiers, British, this is, um, well, first, there hadn't been an occasion to do this before. Um, British soldiers, if a British soldier committed some offense, then yes, he would be tried the same way anyone else would, because soldiers, like anyone else, might, you know, break the law, and then they would be subject to the law. But this time they're actually charged with murder when they were in the course of doing their job, which is to, you know, pr protect the custom house, police the street. So that's a pretty big issue. This is the first trial in colonial America that lasts more than a day. Typically trials would only last a very short time. And the trial doesn't happen until the fall. And, uh, you know, this happens in March. Trial isn't held until the fall. One reason it's put off is Governor Hutchinson is really, he's not so much worried about the soldiers as he's worried about Ebenezer Richardson. Because he knows there's no way for Richardson to escape hanging. And so he delays the opening of the court. He had been the chief justice. Now his brother-in-law is the chief justice. They delay the opening of the court until the fall. So very unusual for British soldiers to be subject to trial in colonial courts. I'm kind of getting off the subject, the topic you asked. But um, now here you think of these soldiers. The town, actually the morning after the event, Hutchinson, still in the council chamber, gathers with the governor's council. And these are men chosen by the assembly to advise the governor. And the meeting is interrupted by a delegation from the Boston town meeting, led by Samuel Adams. The town meeting has been happening at Faneuil Hall. And they demand that Governor Hutchinson order all of these troops out of town. And someone says, someone, I think it was Royal Tyler, another member of the council, says that there are 10,000 men in the surrounding communities ready to come into Boston and force the soldiers out if you don't get them out of town. Hutchinson had given the order to, st someone was going up to Beacon Hill to light the signal fire, which would bring more people into town. Hutchinson had stopped that, but now he hears 10,000 people ready to come in and get the soldiers out of town. Was that true? We don't know. Uh, Hutchinson does say, um, I can't order the soldiers out of town, he says, um, because they're actually under the command of General Gage. You know, Hutchinson's mm -hmm. a civilian mm -hmm. official. These are military troops. They're not under his command. And then they say, well, there are 10,000 men ready to come get them out of town. And Hutchinson says, well, how about if we move the 29th Regiment out, since it was the 29th that was involved in this? And Samuel Adams says, wait a minute. You just told us you couldn't move any of the troops. Now you say you can move one of the regiments. If you can move one, you can move them both. Adams was a very good negotiator. <laughs> Sounds like and, quite the guy. <laughs> yeah, quite the guy. I know if you have teenagers, you kind of know what this is like. <laughs> so Hutchinson um, is kind of stuck, and he does ultimately have the soldiers move first to Castle Island, um, fearing there will be further violence. Now, what happens next is there are two th a couple of things that happen next. We will get back to the trial. But first, um, Peter Oliver, who, or Andrew Oliver, who is the secretary of the province and also sits on the governor's council, sends the minutes of the governor's council off to England and says, look, there was this conspiracy, 10,000 people outside of Boston ready to come in. And this was all part of a preconcerted effort. Now, two things happen as a result of this. One is um, the colonists say, well, wait a minute, there wasn't really any conspiracy. Secondly, what are you doing sending the minutes of our meetings off to London? And this is one thing that makes this a persistent political issue, the fact that Andrew Oliver, who is also a brother-in-law of Thomas Hutchinson, had violated the secrecy of the council meetings by sending their minutes off to England. So also the other thing that happens, as I said, Hutchinson spent the night hearing depositions. The town of Boston also orders a report, and they have about 85 or so witnesses who report what they saw, and then the town publishes its report of this event. And they begin the story in 1767 with the arrival of the customs commissioners. That's when this story began. Now, they, they call this the true account of the horrid massacre perpetrated on King Street, so a horrid massacre. And it's later published along with Paul Revere's engraving of the scene. Now, another version appears in London. It says the trouble really began on Friday morning, March the 2nd, when there was this fight at the rope works. The town report does talk about the fight at the rope works. They say a British soldier challenged a rope worker to a boxing match, and he got beaten, and then the soldiers got really sore. The unofficial report is, I think, a bit more accurate about this just being a fight between a rope worker and a bunch of rope workers and soldiers. So 
each side is trying to spin this event and present it in a certain way. Now, while this is happening, of course, Captain Preston and these soldiers have been charged with murder. No one in town wants to represent them. Someone goes to Josiah Quincy, who is, he's gotten the nickname The Patriot. He is a great supporter of the cause of these American colonies and resistance to Parliament's authority. His brother is actually the chief prosecutor, Samuel Quincy. But someone approaches Josiah Quincy and says, will you defend the soldiers? Here they are being charged with murder. They were attacked by a mob. And remember, the reason they're here is because the thinking of Governor Bernard and British authority was Boston is a lawless place. You need troops to, support, to enforce the law. And Quincy knows that if we can give these soldiers a fair trial, that way we will prove Boston isn't a lawless place. Here are soldiers who can shoot unarmed civilians in the street and get a fair trial. Is that a lawless place? So Quincy says, yes, he will, on the stipulation that John Adams be his co-counsel. Now, John Adams later on remembers this a bit differently. Long after Josiah Quincy is dead, he remembers how someone, this guy came to him, a, an Irish merchant in town who was a friend of some of the soldiers. Some of the soldiers, by the way, were Irish. And this merchant came to, Fran came to Adams and said, here's this man on trial for his life, doesn't have a friend here. And Adams said, in a free country, counsel is the last thing an accused man should want. And so this fellow asked if Adams would represent Captain Preston and the soldiers, and Adams said yes, he would. Was and it risky for him to do that? Well, sure. I mean, Jos when Josiah Quincy agreed to defend the soldiers, his father was outraged, saying, what are you doing? You're ruining your reputation. And because we all know these guys are going to hang, and what do you have to gain by this? And Quincy thought it was a matter of principle. You know, John Adams also realized this was a risky thing. Samuel Adams, by the way, is, supports the prosecution. And the trial, mm -hmm. he sits behind the prosecution Naturally. passing mm -hmm. them notes. And he's outraged that these guys get off. So yeah, it's a very risky thing because you're defending people who in the town's eyes are indefensible. Had John Adams um, decided his position uh, as a patriot yet? Oh yeah, John Adams definitely was a patriot at this time. He had written very influential, well, very important pamphlet on the dis uh, dissertation on the canon and feudal law, talking about the origins of law and the legal order, and he had opposed the Stamp Act and so on. And so he was becoming well known as a patriot. In fact, in the summer of 1770, he was elected to the Massachusetts Assembly and Abigail actually was quite upset at this because his law practice was just beginning to pay off. And now he's drawn into politics. So he's not going to have time to attend to the law, which is what's making the fa earning the family a living. Instead, he'll be doing, you know, serving in the assembly and knowing what a workaholic he was. He would be caught up with writing reports and so on. Um, in fact, by the t when he's finally elected to the Continental Congress, he does give up his law practice and turns it over to a guy. And, Adams recounts much later, you know, Adams, after he lost the election in 1800, had to go back to his farm to support himself. The guy who took over his law practice at this time was one of the wealthiest men in Massachusetts. Oh, wow. So he's giving up a lot. Both Adams and Quincy are giving up a lot by doing this, but it's the call of duty in public service. So Adams tells this fellow who says, you know, will you defend him? Yes, he will. And he says, well, what about how much will it cost? And Adams says, in a case like this, I wouldn't want a fee. And then the guy says, well, I'm sure course. Abigail was happy about she that. She was very happy about this. And then, <laughs> then he says, well, of course, he's not guilty. And Adam says, that is for the jury to decide. And so Adams and Quincy do organize the defense. And they, don't only, they defend Captain Preston, who has his own trial, and then the soldiers. Now, the easy thing to do would be to say, OK, Captain Preston never gave the order to fire. And then he's off. The soldiers fired. But then, then say at this trial, well, they thought they heard the order to fire, but they don't. Instead, essentially at the trial, they try the mob. They do a number of really very, very smart things. Oh, one, interesting. No one on the, on the jury is from Boston. You know, Suffolk County is a fairly wide area, so they're farmers from the surrounding area. And essentially. And they purposefully. Yeah, they purposely them that kept, way. kept Bostonians off of the jury. And then they turn this into, you know, the, the, if you read the prosecution witnesses, it's quite convincing that these, this was an unprovoked attack. 
you read the defense witnesses, it's even more convincing that these guys were getting pummeled by this mob. And you know that both Quincy and Adams are against having these soldiers in town. So what do they have to gain by this? But yeah, they show that these soldiers were under attack. And Adams's closing argument is a wonderful peroration about facts are stubborn things. Great line that you do have these guys who are under attack and that they deserve a fair trial and that um, you know, that justice must be deaf, deaf as an adder to the cries of the populace. And says also that the people in the mob were outsiders. You know, uh, were members car. of the mob observing the trial? Oh, yeah, 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 some were. Um, he says that a car from Ireland and addicts from Framingham, these outsiders who come to Boston and give the town a bad name. Most Bostonians are law-abiding. And he says, it shouldn't surprise anyone that there's a mob in Boston. There have been mobs before. And that um, this particular mob, what do you expect when you have soldiers in town? He says an army will cause two riots for every one it suppresses. You know, military. So he's treading this very interesting line here by attacking the mob, but not the idea of civil order. And the root here is to have the mob. One of the prosecuting attorneys, by the way, is Robert Treat Payne, who's also a patriot. He goes on to be, along with Adams, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And his closing argument is about the danger of having a standing army here. Something that Adams and Quincy would agree with, but the fact that they're a standing army and the fact that everyone hates them doesn't necessarily mean that they're criminally liable for what happened. And then also there's a legal argument here. You can't prove which soldier shot which of the deceased. So the jury acquits all of the soldiers except for Montgomery and Kilroy. And then Adams pleads benefit of clergy, which is a technical thing going back to medieval Europe, where if you could read, the presumption is you're a clergyman and thus subject not to civil courts, but ecclesiastical courts. So he pleads benefit of clergy. And so Kilroy and Montgomery then are branded on the thumbs with an M for manslaughter. That is, they're found guilty of manslaughter, which is still a capital offense. They would have hanged for it branded with an M so that you can't plead benefit of clergy twice. Mm. And then they are sent off to join the regiment in New Jersey. So perhaps being branded on the thumb and sent to New Jersey is punishment enough. <laughs> so did they receive their impartial trial? Yeah, they did. It was a fair trial. I mean, the jury finds them not guilty uh, or guilty of manslaughter. So you do have a jury weighing the evidence. You can think about the town simply wanting to hang these guys because what they, I mean, they shot this unarmed crowd. And one of the judges talks about this copper plate print, the Revere engraving, which has inflamed the public consciousness and made people think they understand what really happened when they don't. But Adam, Adams and Quincy give a very fair, they allow the jury to render a fair verdict. Samuel Adams is outraged by the acquittal. He thinks these guys should hang. You know, but Adams and Quincy are proving a larger point, that here you can give the accused justice, that a, a jury can hear the evidence and dispassionately weigh it.